Now, one of the really useful things that we can do with bond association energies is we can do a rough calculation of delta H for a reaction. Now, these are rough calculations. You need to understand that, but they can give us a good indication of whether a reaction is favorable or not, uh, relative uh, regiochemistry, things like that. We're gonna use them for all different kinds of tools like this, okay? And our table is very limited, so it's really only gonna allow us to work with a few reactions, but in theory, we could have very, very large bond association energy tables for a variety of different species and thereby at least roughly estimate the change in energy for a wide variety of reactions. Now, to do this, we're gonna use something called Hess's law, which I actually don't have called out in our, uh, in our notes here. And I think it might be only very briefly discussed in our textbook. It's something you should have studied in general chemistry. So Hess's law basically says that if we have uh, a series of reactions and we can add those reactions up to get an overall reaction. Remember when we add reactions, we line up the reaction arrows and then we cancel species that are on both sides until we have everything that's left over, that's our net overall reaction. When we do that, the delta H for that overall reaction is going to be the sum of all the delta H's of the individual reactions that we added up. So delta H's are additive. And that has to be the case because of conservation of energy. We can't gain or lose energy in the course of a, of a reaction. And so in theory, what we could do one way to, to calculate an organic chemistry reaction then would be to go through and look at all of the indi individual bond association energy reactions. So for example, here's a CH3 to H. So we could write CH3 to H on one side, put an arrow and then write CH3 radical, hydrogen radical on the other side that would be one of the reactions that we would add up. Then we would write its delta H. Um, I may do an example of this in class on Tuesday. Um, our textbook actually does that this way. They write each reaction, each delta H, when the reaction is in the opposite direction, remember that breaking a bond is a positive one, forming a bond would be a negative, they change the sign, you add them all up, and then you get your overall observed delta H. I consider that to be the long way. Instead, what I would like to show you is my preferred way, okay? Which is to sort of look at Hess's law in a different way, okay? In, in reality, delta H for the overall reaction is gonna be the total of all the delta H's for the bonds that were broken with their sign, which is positive, added to all the delta H's for the bonds that are formed with their sign, which is negative. So when we look at an observed reaction, here's an example. What we can see is in this reaction, we have methane and chlorine, elemental chlorine, they react together. And what is happening is that one of the chlorines is replacing the hydrogen on the methane. And then the hydrogen that was replaced is coming and pairing up with the other chlorine. So they're sort of swapping partners. In order to accomplish this, what we would have to do is break this methyl to hydrogen bond. So this bond is breaking. We would have to break the chlorine to chlorine bond so that we would have all the pieces. Then what we would do is we would have a, a methyl, a hydrogen, a chlorine, and a chlorine. We would recombine those, putting the methyl together with one of the chlorines, forming this bond, and the hydrogen together with the other chlorine, forming this bond. So on the left-hand side of this particular uh, 
reactant reaction. On the left-hand side, we're breaking the two bonds that are being changed. And on the right-hand side, we're forming the bonds. So what we can then do is look up on the table, the bond association energies for these bonds. So for example, the methyl to hydrogen bond is right here and it has a bond association energy of 104. In contrast, if we look the methyl to chlorine bond right here has a bond association energy of 84. Here's the chlorine to chlorine bond. It has a bond association energy of 58. And here's the hydrogen to chlorine bond, bond association energy of 103. So therefore we take those numbers. So the methyl to hydrogen bond was 104. The chlorine to chlorine was 58. The methyl to chlorine was 84 and the hydrogen to chlorine was 103. We put them in to add them up, but then what we have to do is we have to put in the proper sign. So since this bond is breaking, we put in a positive sign. That bond is breaking, it's a positive sign. And then on the negative one, I'm sorry, on the forming ones, we put in negative signs. Now, this just brings up something I may have mentioned to you before that when I do math, I prefer to only add and only multiply. And so when I am supposed to quote unquote subtract, what I prefer to do is add the negative of the number that I'm supposed to subtract. And that just generally, if you start thinking in terms of adding negatives instead of subtracting, it kind of helps you keep track of sort of the directional nature of many of our calculations. When we add this up, we can see that this has a delta H of negative 25 kilocalories per mole. What that means is that in doing this reaction, these reactions have stored potential energy. Reactants have stored potential energy. When we allow them to react, we release that potential energy. And so from our perspective, it would appear to get very hot because the potential energy inside the system is going down, that potential energy is gonna to flow to us who are outside the reaction system and it's gonna increase our potential energy. So this is basically an exothermic reaction, a reaction that's gonna give off heat. Now, the other thing I wanna show you here is that um, in theory, and, and this pretty much works out, it's not perfect, but because um, really we should be working with delta G and when we do delta G, we have to take entropy and the temperature into account and everything. But for, to a rough approximation, if you imagine that our hydrogen to hydrogen bond, which we don't have shown here, but it's on the table, to break it, it costs 104 kilocalories. That's the effort that we need to put in. Those 104 kilocalories would then become stored in the two hydrogens that are formed. As a result, the, because they are identical, they should have an identical amount of potential energy. Since typically what we think of in thermodynamics is when we form a species, the potential energy is inherent to the species, not to where it came from. So therefore, this hydrogen should have half of this, which would be 52, and this hydrogen should have half of this, which is 52. The interesting thing about this then is that when we look at the ethyl to hydrogen bond right here, and imagine breaking it, costing positive 98 kilocalories, this hydrogen that's formed should also have 52 because it doesn't matter how we form the hydrogen, its potential energy is a property of that species. It's delta H, potential energy is a property of that species. What that means then is that this ethyl radical should only have a potential energy of 46. If we then extend that, we can see that this allows us to calculate, I'm sorry, to measure slash calculate the relative potential energy of a wide variety of free radical species when the free radical can be made 
and the bond association can be measured from hydrogen. Okay, so that's sort of summarized here, right? The bond association energy for breaking a CH bond is positive, means that the products of that have a higher potential energy, which we have indicated by saying plus 46, plus 52. The potential energy of the hydrogen part would always be the same, however. So the hydrogen would already have 52. So therefore, if this number changes, the amount that we need to break the bond, then the change in potential energy would have to be in the carbon piece. And the higher that number, the less stable that carbon piece, because um, higher potential energy means instability. So therefore, any differences in the BDE for different CH bonds must indicate a difference in the potential energy of the carbon radicals. Okay. So now let me show this to you graphically kind of how this works out. So what I've done is I have taken numbers directly from our bond association energy table for four different carbon to hydrogen bonds. A carbon hydrogen bond from a methyl to a hydrogen, a carbon hydrogen bond from a primary to a hydrogen, secondary to hydrogen, tertiary to hydrogen. Basically the four types of carbon groups that we've been working with up until now. You can see that those numbers, and you could look those up on the table and you would see the methyl has a delta H of plus 104 to break. The primary is plus 98. The secondary is plus 95. And the tertiary is plus 91. The other thing you can see on the table, if you go look at it, that's very interesting. You see it particularly for the methyl, um, I'm sorry, for the primary because I have primary from ethyl and primary from propyl, is that primary carbons, the CH bond association energy, is almost the same for most primary carbons. The exceptions are primary carbons that are adjacent to groups that can do resonance, like phenyl, carbon-carbon double bond, carbon-oxygen double bond. Those are changed by the resonance. But for anything that can't do resonance, primary carbon to hydrogen bonds have approximately the same bond association energy. Notice that we don't generally have super, super high um, precision numbers here. We, you know, we're, we're basically plus or minus 1% here, okay? So what I've done then is I've kind of made a little table. And what I did was I... I imagined setting all of the initial carbon species before we break them to the same potential energy level. Now that probably is not completely accurate, but what we're gonna see is they're gonna behave similarly as if they were on the same potential energy level. Then we imagine breaking the bond. So when we break the bond, we're putting potential energy in. So as a result, we're starting down here, we break the bond, we come up here, this is the potential energy, total potential energy of the two pieces now, right? We started with one thing, we broke it into two pieces by putting in potential energy, each piece takes part of that potential energy. If we add up those two, the potential energy of those two pieces, we would get a total distance traveled up of 104. In contrast, if we look at the primary one, we're only going up 98. So what that means is that our line that we draw here on our potential energy graph is going to be lower than the line for th that we drew here for the methyl. Because we go up 104, that means we end up higher than when we go up only 98. And similarly, we go up 95, it's even lower and we go up 91, it's even lower. So we can see that on our graph, the result is that we have a lower amount of potential energy as we go from methyl to tertiary. But the really interesting thing about this is that, and, and it's not to scale, you can see I, I didn't put my line in quite the right place, 
but the potential energy of the carbon, I'm sorry, of the hydrogen radical is gonna be the same no matter which bond we broke. We, we talked about that in the previous thing. In fact, we know it's gonna be about 52. So that's the first, we go up the amount that the hydrogen radical has, then we add the amount that the carbon radical has. And so effectively, what we see is that this distance here from where the hydrogen radical is, which is all the same, up to the carbon radical changes. That shows that these carbon radicals have different amounts of potential energy, which means they have a different stability, but we can in fact directly compare them. So we see that the methyl radical has approximately 52 kilocalories per mole, whereas the primary has only 46, the secondary has only 43, and the tertiary has 39. What we would conclude then is that the tertiary, I'm sorry, the tertiary carbon radical is more stable than the primary or more stable than the methyl. And if we were to generalize, we would say, well, it appears that change replacing a hydrogen on a carbon radical with a carbon group decreases the potential energy of that carbon radical. It makes that carbon radical more stable. This is the same trend that we saw for carbocations, right? Where as we had more and more carbon groups attached to the carbocation carbon, it became more stable. This actually shouldn't be surprising because what we said is radicals behave like they're lacking electrons, just like carbocations do. And so if we look here, in general, a lower CH bond association energy indicates a more stable carbon radical. And when we list those in order, we can see that the least stable would be the methyl, followed by primary, secondary, and tertiary would have the lowest potential energy, so therefore it would be the most stable. And tertiary radicals should be more stable because they have more carbon groups. Carbon radicals behave like they're lacking electrons. Groups that donate electrons stabilize the electron deficient carbon species. And then it just flipped over to the next page. Carbon groups donate more electrons when you compare it to hydrogens. And so replacing hydrogens with carbon groups means more electrons are being donated to the central radical that's missing electrons means that that radical will be more stable. Um, this semester later on, we're gonna take a deeper look at electron donation. What we see is this effect is through what we call is, is donation through the sigma bonds. And we generally call that inductive donation. 